Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, March uh, monthly event for the uh, San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the uh, IEEE Power Electronics Society or PELS. Um, and by the way, for any of you who noticed the, the typo in some of our materials and mentioned the July meeting, so for you sharp eagle eyes out there, thanks for catching that. This is, in fact, March. You are not in a time warp. Uh, my name is Brian Zonstecker, and I am the current chair. Um, and uh, we want to uh, save most of our time for our featured speaker today. There's lots of good stuff there, so uh, we'll keep the intro short. Um, but just want to let you know that we're uh, a, a local uh, Bay Area Pels chapter is always uh, looking to, um, you know, we're always trying to put together new uh, events and uh, hopefully things of interest to uh, for our membership as well as the rest of you out there in the IEEE and extended community. So uh, please feel free to contact us or reach us um, if you have any questions, suggestions, or anything um, in the chat window. Uh, you'll see I put, oops, sorry. Um, uh, I, there is a link to our webpage uh, if you want to uh, uh, check that out, as well as um, note that there is a archives uh, section where uh, today's webinar, uh, which Francesco has generously agreed to let us record and post, uh, we will post this webinar as well as a, uh, a PDF of his slides that he's made available to us. Um, I want to make sure and uh, have a big thanks to our sponsors, uh, particularly the, uh, the IEEE Power Electronics Society, who's helped us uh, very well at the society level, as well as our co-sponsors, the Santa Clara Valley Comsoc chapter, uh, thanks to uh, Benham Desfouli and uh, MP DeVacher, uh, as well as the uh, Santa Clara Valley uh, Consumer Technology Society, uh, more formerly the CES, the uh, uh, Consumer Electronics Society, and Joseph Way. So uh, we welcome those members uh, as well to this and thank them for joining. So uh, with no further ado, let's get to the main event. Uh, oh, excuse me. One thing before that, just want to remind people, um, please, if you can try and uh, save your questions for the end, as we do not intend to uh, interrupt the presentation uh, for, um, for Q&A, but just put it in the Q&A box and we will uh, address them at the end. Um, uh, we'll be monitoring that. So if it looks like there's any, you know, key emergency thing that comes up or any real issue or, or, or um, you know, uh, quick clarification that's necessary, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll, let, uh, we'll let Francesco know. But otherwise, we'll let him go through his presentation and then we'll uh, take Q&A at the end. So uh, with that, uh, Francesco Carabolante is a senior member of the IEEE a member of the steering and technical committees for several IEEE PELS and PSMA initiatives, including PowerSOC, PowerPack, and Enerharv. Uh, he's the co-chair of the IEEE 5G Roadmap Energy Efficiency Working Group and is principal of IOTSIMO, where he helps global organizations and young companies develop technology and business strategies to compete in today's fast-changing high-tech world. He created many industry firsts, among which the Magnetic Resonance Wireless Power Transfer that received the Best of Innova Innovation Award honoree at the 2015 Consumer Electronics Show, as he's showing there. And uh, he's authored over 90 U.S. patents, that's 90, um, and, is, and has been an invited keynote speaker and expert panelist at several premier international conferences. He received his Master of Science in Electrical Engineering uh, degrees uh, from both uh, University of Padova in Italy and UCLA in California. So uh, with that, the floor is yours, Francesco. Thank you, Brian, for the kind introduction and welcome to everyone online. A few years ago, I had the fortune to lead the development of the wireless charging project at Qualcomm and to develop the A4WP standard which later became known as the 6.78 megahertz implementation of the AFA or Air Fuel Alliance standard. It has been one of the most interesting and challenging engineering efforts I have directed. And as you see from this picture, it led to the 2015 Innovation Award at CES. The prototype shown 
was quite cute, actually. Uh, since the transmitter in this technology has no magnetic material shields, it can charge on both sides of the antenna. Thus, you can use it standing up, as you see on the bigger picture. Uh, so you can basically stand up your phones, or you can flip it down and uh, on the other side and charge it using it flat on the table. So that was built only in a few samples uh, for basically marketing purposes, but I happen to have one. <laughs> and uh, so here's the agenda for this presentation. First, a brief history of the efforts and why we chose 6.78 megahertz, uh, followed by describing how we get uh, to seamlessly power any number of receivers. Then a few less known topics, how to charge through a metal back cover, for example, and how to enable wearables and other small devices uh, on a standard to, to be able to charge on a standard transmitter. By the way, all of this information that I'm sharing today has been published years ago but it is scattered across the IEEE universe. So hopefully this uh, kind of uh, gets you the leads to search and find the interesting tidbits about this technology. Uh, the topics uh, that could be covered um, in, in the webinar are virtually infinite. At Qualcomm, we organize a full three-day seminar just to get the partners to understand the basics of the technology and how we implemented it. So that gives you an idea, that three full days of training just to get people started. So there's plenty of topics, but obviously we have uh, less than an hour, so we'll try to uh, focus on a few issues. So safety, we're not talk gonna talk about that. You cannot commercialize a product unless it passes safety compliance certification, no matter what the competition says. So please stop this nonsense. Such comments are only meant to create confusion and frankly, don't show a lot of integrity on <laughs> who talks about it. That said, if you believe that EM fields are bad for you in general, well, I cannot contradict you, uh, but you get a lot more of them from your Wi-Fi system and the cellular devices that you will, uh, that you carry with you. Uh, certainly much more than you will ever get from a wireless charger. Uh, just study the physics and you'll figure that out. And no matter what uh, some uh, conspiracy theorists say, believes uh, and say, no, none of these technologies causes COVID. Uh, but they do facilitate spreading all kinds of nonsense. So we did all of our development with class E amplifiers because the engineers that worked at it at Qualcomm um, were mostly RF engineers. Uh, but if you like class D, just go for it. Uh, I'm not going to tell you there is any better or worse. And Yes, uh, Bluetooth is optional. The original design that we did was fully in-band communication, but it is so much fun to think about all that you can do with it uh, at the system level that uh, you know we gladly accepted in introducing the Bluetooth uh, um, communication as part of the A4WP standards because again of the options that it it enables in terms of the system capabilities. So I do not know where we lost track of what people mean by wireless, but according to my wife, it means when there are no wires on the table. She is very concerned about both aesthetics and making sure the desk is clean. And that is her definition of wireless. She, since uh, she is a tough customer, I take her comments very seriously. Today, 
We talk about magnetic resonance, wireless power transfer, a technology that allows much more freedom of position in the XYZ space than magnetic induction, but does not have the challenges of far field RF beaming, uh, which is currently limited to lower powers uh, because of the complexity of such uh, solutions and still a lot of, uh, let's say, limitations that come with that. So we're going to limit ourselves to talk about what we call short to mid-range magnetic res uh, resonance type of solution. And that operates in the near field regime. Uh, so it doesn't operate as a far field, uh, but uh, fundamentally that means that it operates in a distance from the antenna that is typically less than a tenth of the uh, wavelength. So that's uh, the magnetic resonance type of solution. A typical question is, does a magnetic induction have better efficiency than magnetic resonance? The answer is only if the receiver and transmitter are perfectly aligned and very close to each other. As you see from this graph, as soon as we move out of that condition, that's no longer the case. Actually, um, uh, magnetic induction has a lower efficiency than magnetic resonance. And the probability, unless you really make like uh, the, the, the case of a toothbrush, uh, the probability that you're perfectly aligned and close is not very high. In normal operating conditions, you're never going to have such a perfect alignment. Um, and that is why 20 kilowatt chargers for electric vehicles use magnetic resonance, and they achieve greater than 90% efficiency. So, you know, the intrinsic efficiency of the antenna to antenna is, is fairly high. Uh, that's not uh, how you get, uh, let's say, from your theoretically over 90% to the more typical 60% that you see in the applications. What gets you from 90 to 60 is all the electronics, uh, typically low cost electronics, that go all the way from the AC plug all the way to the battery at the other end. So all the steps in between are what eats up the majority of the efficiency. So <clears throat> if the benefits of this technology are so great, why is the adoption of the magnetic resonance technology lagging? Why don't we see it espoused uh, you know, much more broadly? <clears throat> the the issue is that the objective system is way too complicated for brute force solutions and simple solutions. Large number of elements, each with tolerances, and some are nonlinear. Large operational voltage ranges, loads that span three orders of magnitude in terms of current requirements, um, and all ranges of reactants from inductive to capacitive. Um, there's variable couplings and there's resonances. And each receiver fundamentally is requesting a slightly different optimization point to achieve maximum efficiency. Putting all of this together makes the system extremely difficult to model, simulate, and, and actually uh, optimize. <clears throat> And this is where it takes a serious system engineering to understand where one can even start. Luckily, though, in our team at Qualcomm, we had uh, uh, the system engineer who developed the original CDMA standard. He enjoyed actually working on the toughest problem. And uh, here is what he had to say about the wireless charging through magnetic resonance. Wireless power transfer is much more complicated than CDMA. These are his famous words, uh, one of the inventors of CDMA, when he actually helped uh, us develop the wireless power system. <clears throat> 
So let me share with you a brief history of our efforts uh, at Qualcomm. It started about 14 years ago, uh, following the idea of powering large devices at a distance. And then 13.56 uh, megahertz um, uh, was adopted, uh, was a standard uh, ISM bands. Um, and uh, unfortunately, though, had both because of the specifications of, in that band, there were both power and efficiency limitations. So we moved uh, to 6.78 megahertz and developed the fundamental concepts of using the impedance behavior to automate power control and power sharing. Why is that? Because in a wireless power transfer system, the feedback is too slow to react to load changes. Load changes occur instantaneously. You put a device on the charger or you remove one, or basically even the device on the charger can go from high current to low current demands. And fundamentally, those things happen much faster than you can communicate between transmitter and receiver or basically sense these changes and adapt basically the transmitter to the new requirement. So the control of the power transfer has to work like you have in a power line in a typical DC or AC system, uh, where fundamentally uh, you plug in a new load and the other ones don't even notice. Of course, unless you reach the limit of the power that the transmitter can deliver. In which case, by the way, the system that we design, uh, design can decide if, for example, lowering the power to each device to maintain within the limit of its capability or prioritizing some of the devices. So later we acquired actually a very talented team from Bipower, a spin-off of University of Florida. And by the way, I would like to acknowledge here uh, Ryan Sang, that was the CEO of that company and now CEO of uh, uh, Shield AI. So really an amazing uh, engineer and leader. And uh, he contributed a lot to this technology. So their original design uh, was at 500 kilohertz. Besides having limitation for worldwide regulatory constraints, um, it tended to overheat the metal parts of the smartphones. At that frequency, low frequencies just don't work well with metals. Um, but there was a lot of learning on the effect of both the H and E field. Um, so this was uh, a time of great learnings. And uh, that is why you now see that all the original A4WP antennas uh, designed, were designed with crossovers and particular characteristics that fundamentally uh, address some of the constraints that are generated by both electrical and magnetic fields. Um, more sophisticated designs also employ multiple series capacitors within the antenna to reduce the E field. Um, but fundamentally, <clears throat> symmetry and perfectly differential construction is fundamental because common mode noise is the most difficult to eliminate. So <clears throat> anyway, after all these experiences, we have been worked already at uh, four different uh, frequencies, we decided to reassess all available frequencies and came to the conclusion that 6.78 megahertz was the best solution to address all requirements. So we started at that time the standardization process through a partnership with other companies, which we call A4WP or Alliance for Wireless Power. Um, so why 6.78 megahertz? Due to the physics of electrical conduction in metals that are exposed to an electromagnetic field, illuminating a device with frequencies below one megahertz leads to excessive heat dissipation in the metallic parts. Uh, 
And you cannot realistically create a system that enables freedom of placement for charging devices of different sizes without exposing their bodies to the electromagnetic field. You can only do it if you have a given device size with a set dimension so that you can match transmitter and receiver coil sizes to the point where the field is constrained. But the objective that was put in front of the team at Qualcomm was to charge any device size and any power level. Uh, our marketing team was very demanding. They, they wanted any number of devices, any number of power levels, any kind of shape. So they really gave us some really crazy uh, targets to achieve. In the end, it is a trade-off among different constraints. If one tries to maximize efficiency across the whole system, the ideal frequency is between one and three megahertz. Lower frequencies simply simplify system design. Higher frequencies facilitate the use of smaller coils, uh, for example, for wearables. Since output voltage in the receiver is equal to the product of the transmitter current times the mutual inductance times the frequency. So again, at higher frequency, uh, you get the benefit that you can basically reduce the mutual, therefore reduce the number of turns, and you can make smaller uh, coils. And you'll see an example of this later. I'm sure you have seen these formulas. All of this looks uh, quite pretty. You can find it in any book or paper. Uh, too bad this is not reality because it does not consider the fact that all quantities are complex and some are even nonlinear. So these formulas help understanding the basics, but that is the easy part. Anybody can make a wireless power transfer system. The difficult part is to make one that performs well in all conditions. <clears throat> so we can get fancier and invoke all the laws of physics. Uh, this is all true, but quite difficult to apply in the real cases where the complexity of a multi-device charger cannot realistically be simulated for all conditions in a, in a time frame that is compatible with business requirements. Have you tried to use a, an, electro, an EM simulator like Maxwell or whatever, or others? Um, how much complexity can you add before simulation time goes to infinity? So bottom line, we need to address the system, you know, from, from a different standpoint. Uh, we cannot just uh, uh, tame it by just using computer power. So let's start analyzing the basics. <clears throat> Series resonance is the ideal configuration. We'll see later how it makes load management easy. Shunt resonance is difficult to control. When you load it, the control of power delivery to multiple loads becomes a nightmare. Hybrid resonance is a compromise that can be used cautiously to meet the requirement, specific requirements. Typically, um, useful for large Z distance, Another application with low mutual inductance. So it helps to meet the voltage requirement of the receiver by implementing an impedance transformation. As I said earlier, the only way to properly engineer the system is to create a complete end-to-end -end model. Power flows from left to right and impedance flows from right to left. Note that each sub-block has a variable transformation function depending on the complex impedance it sees. Furthermore, many of the blocks have no linear characteristics. Thus, the, impedance chain, the impedances 
change significantly over the output loading condition. Therefore, the efficiency of each subblock depends on the operating condition. And peak efficiency of each block may occur at different loads because of the complex impedance loading of each block. By calculating the total efficiency as a product of each subblock and plotting it over the load variation, one can understand the behavior of each impedance transformation and optimize it. The low pass filter, for example, in the transmitter removes the harmonics for EMI compliance because, of course, typically your power amplifier for the transmitter is a square wave and, you know, to make it efficient. And therefore, it creates all kinds of uh, harmonics which you need to remove from the antenna uh, to avoid the EMI compliance issues. So, um, so fundamentally, you always have this, uh, this uh, low pass filter in the transmitter, uh, but that low pass filter can do much more. Uh, you can study the impedance transformation so as to um, um, adjust all the parameters of the system uh, because, as I mentioned, it's not real. You don't operate in, in, a, in a perfect uh, um, resonance where basically all the uh, reactances disappear and the system is real. No, you don't. Everything is complex. And so fundamentally, you can leverage the complex, uh, complex characteristics of the subblocks um, to actually align the peak power uh, point with the peak efficiency point, um, which otherwise uh, would not align necessarily uh, for the same uh, resonant coil impedance, and also to achieve a relatively constant efficiency over the variation of the imaginary component of the load. Remember, the load is never purely real. When you put an object in the field, Depending on the combination of metals, magnetic materials, and actually the battery charging characteristics, I mean, how much power level and so on, the load seen by the transmitter has a very wide variation on both the real and the imaginary part. That is why the simplified equations that show you the operations at resonance are never satisfied in the real world. As mentioned earlier, the series resonant configuration has great advantages as it simplifies load management. And now we'll see why. The receiver load resistance is inverted on the transmitter side. So if you look at the, basically this formula, uh, fundamentally the load presented by the receiver to the transmitter fundamentally ends up in series with what you see here as R1. Uh, so fundamentally, it gets reflected to the transmitter in series with its own parasitic resistance and actually inverted, which means that is one over whatever the load is at the output. So if the transmitter is a constant current source, when the receiver load resistance decreases, which means when it draws more power, the input power to the transmitter naturally increases by the same amount because the resistance ends up in series to the constant current being delivered and uh, one over the resistance, which means that fundamentally, uh, as the resistance of the load becomes small, the resistance in series with the, the transmitter, the reflected resistance becomes large, which means you drive more power, which is what the load requires. So it automatically adjusts the power based on the requests of the receiver. 
So <clears throat> no change in the driving is required. No control needs to take place. Now the resonator efficiency is a function of the receiver resonator plus uh, the load, the, the load plus R1, R2, and there's a mutual involved in that. So efficiency peaks at an optimum load resistance, which can be easily calculated. So this part is relatively easy to figure out how to optimize. But the important thing, as I said, is that the control loop does not need to do anything when the load changes, because the physics of this configuration, of the series series configuration, fundamentally takes care of automatically adjusting the power transmitted based on the power required, as long as you drive the transmitter with a constant current. Not only we do not need to intervene if a single receiver's requested power, you know, more power or less power, the same is true for multiple receivers as well. As long as we drive the transmitter with a constant current, any additional load that we put on the transmitter just adds in series to the resonant loop. So it naturally uh, requires the power from the transmitter and the transmitter naturally adjusts its power transmitted. So there's no control needed to actually deliver all the power needed at all times without changing anything. <clears throat> so the load of multiple receivers adds in series on the transmitter side and, uh, and basically when the transmitter is driven by a constant current, the input power naturally adjusts as the output, uh, the, the receivers request a, a different power. And each receiver, by the way, um, sees the same transmitter current. So the fundamental equation that tells you what's the output voltage on the receiver is, is absolutely constant because it's driven by the input current, the transmitter current times M times the frequency. So again, uh, there's no, as long as the two receivers don't have significant interaction of the two receive antenna, which is typically the case, uh, there's no, uh, the, each receiver does not see any change because another receiver is placed on the transmitter. Uh, of course, receivers with different mutual inductance need to be designed to operate at the same transmitter current within their output voltage ranges. So you need to design each receiver so that it basically works with a given transmitter current. And that's part of the specifications. So one additional thing that this show, this uh, picture may kind of get you to think. If the load impedance is complex, it will also be reflected as a complex impedance. It's just inverted. So here we show kind of only the resisted, the real part being inverted, but the whole complex impedance of the receiver is inverted. Uh, so any load change, um, you know, will be reflected also from the reactive part of, of the load. And that's why it's important that basically uh, the, the system is designed to tolerate a large variation in the reactive impedance. So let's see next. Oh, in conclusion, do not try to operate a resonance first because you will not be able to <laughs> Uh, you know, the, 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 the range of uh, what happens to the system is all over the place. So you'll never statistically be able to be at resonance. And second, because it uselessly constrains you to make design choices that limit your ability to optimize the system. Operating off resonance, off resonance, does not reduce your efficiency. The losses are always caused by the real part of the impedance. And that doesn't change because it is real. It's real resistance. 
the imaginary part that you are left with when you are off resonance can actually be used to optimize the system behavior. Uh, so the key strategy is to use the impedance transformation property of the blocks in the system to align the maximum power with the maximum efficiency and to obtain a relatively flat efficiency over the variation of the reactive part of the load. Okay, enough with the basics, uh, even if we really uh, just scratch the surface. It's time to actually look at some more complex scenarios uh, that magnetic resonance can address. When would you want to replace a two coil system with three or more, three or four, for example? Um, since efficiency of a resonant coupled system is proportional to k, the coupling coefficients, time the square root of q1 and q2, where q1 is uh, uh, the um, quality factor of the first resonator and q2 is the quality factor of the other resonator. One is the transmitter, one is the receiver. So it's the product of those two uh, quantities, the, the coupling, and the quality factor. So if coupling between transmitter and receiver is low, we compensate it with high quality factor, high Q, to obtain the same basically uh, system efficiency. Therefore coupling, for example, number one and number three, so between coil one and coil two and coil three and coil four, um, may have a high K, I mean, and a low Q, because of course you have the resistance of the transmitter on one side and the resistance of the load on the other side. Well, for example, the sec coupling number two between coil two and coil three has a high Q because you can make them just a resonant uh, LC and a low K because they're placed at a distance. So this is a possible scenario where you can actually have four, four resonators, let's say, but quite frankly, this implementation rarely gives you a better efficiency than a two coil system. But there are extreme cases where it may work. And quite frankly, probably uh, only when coupling number one and number three are high enough, uh, tight enough to be close to a transformer, in which case there is no independent resonance between coil one and two and between coil three and four. So again, uh, we end up in a case where it's questionable if you can say that there's like uh, four independent resonators. What about three coils and two couplings? If you remember the initial equations, Every resonant coupling inverts the impedance as seen by the transmitter. Therefore, if you have three coils and two couplings, uh, you no longer can add the loads without losing those great properties of automatic load management that we discussed earlier. But there is an exception. Here it is. Um, this is an interesting case. How do you charge a device with a metal case? You know, everybody's like, oh, metal case, that, that shields uh, from electromagnetic field. Well, it's true, but you can actually be smart and use it. Well, you can use the metal case as a coil. And as long as you're operating at frequencies greater than one megahertz, the, for example, the aluminum case, typically the case is made of aluminum, uh, the, the case does not heat up at all. But this means you now have three coils and two couplings. Why does this work? Because the coupling of the case and the inner coil is a tight coupling. They're really attached to each other. Uh, it's not a real resonant coupling. So there is no inversion. It is like a transformer. So really the only resonant coupling is between the transmitter and the case of the phone in this case, the, the other coupling is more like a transformer. And in this case, basically the old metal back cover captures the field and the slot between the camera hole and the wireless one antenna forces 
the current to concentrate around the hole. Coupling to the internal coil is excellent. In fact, we achieve higher power transfer with this implementation than with the typical A4WP coil. And it's a lot smaller. So the coil is really pretty tiny. The actual coil, as shown in the previous slide, uh, picture, is only a couple of centimeter wide. Let me go back. You see it on the left picture. I mean, the coil is really tiny, but it does the job. Um, here's another challenging application. Uh, wearables and small devices. The field, when captured by a receiver of a few centimeter diameter, may look relatively uniform across these large coils. I mean, the coils shown there on the, you know, let me see if I can uh, uh, show it here. Okay, this coil was a typical A4WP coil, and it is basically, you know, 15 by 22 centimeter or some, something in that range. So the, the spacing of the, of, of the coils is, is very large. So if you have a relatively large device, you average out the field pretty well. But if you have a very tiny device, your field goes up and down pretty dramatically. So, um, it's a challenge for the receiver to get enough output voltage when the mutual is low and to prevent breakdown when the coupling is at its maximum. The voltage uh, at the uh, receiver is, is all over the place. So if you go to this article, there's a lot of interesting details in these pictures that we're not going to have the time to discuss, and they're not obvious at first. Uh, but in conclusion, the implementation you see in the next slides does not require the CTC converter. The old PIMI controller fits in the center of the antenna so that the old receiver is less than 0.5 millimeter thick, drastically smaller than what you typically find today in all the smart watches that you see on the market. So it's amazing that they haven't caught up with what can be done to make it you know, really thin and small. So here's how. This is the complete receiver in one chip. It's just basically a tunable capacitor and a full wave synchronous rectifier. Um, the complete solution though requires multiple innovation. The first one is the insertion of uh, a uh, variable capacitor in the resonant tank which moves the tuning from resonant point when coupling is low to greatly detune when the coupling is high. This gives you a fairly large range of tuning, but it is not enough for the extreme cases. So we need some more tricks. And here's the tricks. Basically, at the extreme of the variable capacitance range, uh, the resonant tank presents a residual reactance to the synchronous rectifier. So it's not purely real, it's not at resonance, which allows for adiabatic transfer of power as you can obtain in a buck or boost converter. The result is that you can directly charge the battery from the resonator through the rectifier without any DC-DC converter, thus drastically increasing efficiency. The antenna coil acts as the inductance for the DC-DC converter. The residual reactance of the sum of antenna coil plus capacitor in series acts as the reactance for the DC-DC converter. So uh, graphing all that happens in all the regions that we discussed of operation makes for colorf colorful plots, which look very good on the IEEE papers. Uh, what is not said in the papers is how many of these plots had to be created before getting it all right. So this is just a, a nice plot, but uh, how many did we make before getting it right? I don't even want to say. I think we are running out of time. So if there's more questions, so we can address them later with the, uh, EMI or Brian, let me know if you want me to spend another couple of minutes on EMI and Dsense, or if you want to leave more room to um, questions. 
Um, this is always kind of a key. I think it's an important point. So go ahead and uh, take uh, uh, you know, two minutes. A couple, couple more minutes. Okay. That'll be great. Thanks. All right. So <clears throat> another topic is basically <clears throat> EMI. And everybody knows about EMI and common mode noise. And common mode noise is the most difficult to eliminate. That is why both transmitters and receivers are designed in perfectly differential manner. That solves a lot of problems. Beside the transmitter itself, the rectifier in the receiver is the largest source of harmonics. Uh, why? Because fundamentally, if you put the current of the receiver into a rectifier, uh, you typically get a very large discontinuity uh, every time the rectifier basically starts conducting or stops conducting. And that basically uh, is coupled directly to the antenna. So the current, you know, is uh, reflected back into the antenna and therefore the antenna then transmits out all these discontinuities, which fundamentally means that you're generating a lot of harmonics uh, because of the rectifier itself. So there's ways to minimize that um, uh, by actually preventing the rectifier from actually having sharp transitions. You can create harmonic filters within the rectifier to actually uh, implement uh, uh, filtering at those frequencies. Um, and besides EMI compliance, uh, the other area where that most of the time is not discussed in this application is what we call descents. Uh, most people are not familiar with this. Um, every smartphone must satisfy some receiver sensitivity criteria to be approved by the FCC. Not only the noise created by the system must be reduced at the wireless one antenna to maintain appropriate signal to noise ratio, but anything that shields the antenna can cause a degradation of sensitivity. Your hands do that too. That is why there is a wireless one antenna both at the top and the bottom of your smartphone. Top and bottom both have antennas. So that no matter how you handle it, it will use the antenna that is not shielded by your hand. Sensitivity is quickly lost if you place the phone on a metal surface as it acts as a shield. So magnetic materials, copper are great shields and in low frequency solution, they reduce the receiver sensitivity by about 12 dB. That means that if you are in a low signal areas, you might miss the phone call. So this sense when you design the system is much tougher to achieve than actually uh, EMI compatibility because the antennas are so sensitive that actually uh, for the designers of our system, it was much more difficult to meet the descents uh, uh, type of requirements uh, than actually the, uh, the EMI. Uh, interesting enough, it looks like really nobody cares in the market. The only ones that care are the carriers because fundamentally, if you uh, desensitize the, uh, your receiver, uh, fundamentally, um, the users may complain that it doesn't get enough signal from the tower. And that means that uh, it complains with the service provider that he needs to put more towers. Um, but apparently nobody seemed to pay attention. So this is an interesting pattern that actually was created at the time where you can build uh, fundamentally uh, notch filters for the harmonics directly in the uh, antenna design on a PC board by just by creating uh, capacitive coupling uh, within the antenna design that actually generate a notch filter. So interesting thing. So key concept in the end, just very quickly summary, frequency choice determines the heat dissipated in metals. Efficiency in the receiver is more important than overall efficiency. 
because the receiver otherwise gets hot and you cannot charge it. Operating at resonance is not important. Actually, it is not beneficial at all and you couldn't achieve it anyway. Uh, what matters is optimizing the end-to-end -end efficiency, power delivery and power sharing by multiple loads must be inherently achieved by the impedance behavior of the system. Control loops are too slow to deal with it. Make everything differential, transmitter and receiver. Common mode noise is the most difficult one to eliminate. And really, we just scratched the surface. Uh, as the system engineer said, this is way more complicated than CDMA. So good luck and enjoy the challenge. <laughs> Any question? All right. Well, thank you very much, Francesco, for that uh, excellent and uh, comprehensive and very practical presentation. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, let's see, the first one comes to us from uh, Payne Ferret. Uh, can you please go to slide six, as that is what his question is concerning? Sure. Okay. Slide six. There you go. <clears throat> and he's asking, are the curves on the graph uh, frequency dependent? Um, I don't think so. Uh, but everything, every system is done at, <clears throat> at a specific frequency. So frequency has to do with the calculation of um, e efficiency, uh, basically because of the formula that I mentioned that uh, the, 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 the um, sorry, um, the, the output voltage that you need. So fundamentally, the receiver needs a given output voltage to operate, and that's given by the uh, electronics in your receiver. And, uh, and fundamentally, you trade off the mutual inductance and the current on the transmitter, of course, and, uh, and the frequency. So for any frequency, you adjust those parameters independently. Um, so once you optimize the system, then fundamentally that's what you have. So this plot indicates simply the coil to coil efficiency it has nothing to do with the electronics that is, uh, before or after it, it is purely a coil to coil efficiency plot. Now. This was uh, actually derived by MediaTek, so I, I'm not sure exactly how that was done. But fundamentally, um, again, it, it deals only with coil-to-coil -coil efficiency, not with all the rest of the system. I don't know if that answers the question. All right. All right. Well, well, I hope it is. And, uh, and as a reminder to everyone, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box, not, not the chat box, but the, uh, the Q&A box, and we'll, uh, we'll address them here. So uh, next one comes to us from uh, Khalif. And uh, Khalif says, um, a high frequency such as 6 megahertz operating at resonance will surely produce a high voltage across the inductor coil. So how do you deal with such a risk of electrocution? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, the so if you're talking about the transmitter, usually the transmitter is uh, used uh, at relatively high voltages uh, in the tens of volts, uh, although sub 60 volts actually is considered uh, not, um, not uh, a risk. Um, yeah. The receiver, actually, you have to charge the battery. So the receiver voltage is always only a few volts. Uh, typical system, no matter if you look at uh, uh, low frequency or high frequency system, they typically limit uh, the maximum voltage uh, sub 20 volts because otherwise you need to use high voltage uh, uh, semiconductor processes, which are not efficient. So it, the receiver never really goes past 20 volts. And that's you know, right. when he's, when he's uh, operating in extreme conditions, not normal conditions. Uh, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, next question comes to us from Pat Pasong. And he says, uh, what does it mean to say that impedance flows from the right side to the left side, which is opposite <laughs> to the flow of power? <laughs> okay. 
So uh, it doesn't flow really impedance is what it is. Uh, sorry for the, you know, uh, uh, artistic uh, description. Uh, what I mean is that uh, you calculate the impedance seen by the transmitter by starting with the impedance that is provided by the receiver and then calculating sub block by sub block all the way to the transmitter, what the transmitter sees, because at each sub block you have an impedance transformation. So the receiver is a given impedance, but then what is the impedance seen by the transmitter is, is the uh, multiplication of, of all those blocks from right to left. So I meant you calculate the impedance starting from the receiver, okay? <laughs> Fair but enough. Impedance doesn't uh, really flow. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. The next question comes from Akshay Sarin. Uh, it says, why does the heating of metals reduce at higher frequencies? Shouldn't high frequency cause higher eddy currents? No, actually, it's, uh, it's somewhat related to the uh, skin effect. So fundamentally, <clears throat> higher frequency. Oh, this is an interesting one, actually. If you operate at really low frequency, and you have a relatively thin metal, your EM field can cross, go across the metal. So you can actually receive the power across a metal surface. The point is that um, as you increase the frequency, the depth of the pre penetration of the field decreases. So that means that fundamentally a high frequency, the current uh, because fundamentally what the metal is trying to do is to shield, is basically trying to create a current in the metal that opposes the field, right? So the field hits the metal, the metal generates eddy currents that tend to oppose the field, okay? So now the, at high frequency, the, uh, the, the, the currents that are capable of opposing the field are generated in a very extremely thin layer of the metal. So fundamentally, uh, if you consider that the total resistance is very tiny because it doesn't actually uh, expand through the old metal. So this, the, the very superficial layer of the metal is able to generate enough um, uh, eddy currents to oppose the field without really penetrated much, penetrating much into the metal. Uh, it, it's, it's not that simple, but that's the fundamental concept. As I said, if you go down to low frequency, even down to 100 kilohertz, you find that if you have, if your metal is just, uh, you know, a fraction of a millimeter, uh, then the field is not even uh, stopped. I mean, the, the, the penetration of the field in the metal is much larger than the thickness of the metal, which means you still have field the other side of the metal. Okay. <laughs> so you can transmit power even at low frequency across a metal. It's just that the losses are very high. All right. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Next question comes from Min Ai. And uh, Min asks, is frequency splitting caused by overcoupling matter and magnetic <laughs> resonance coupling? Yeah, that's true. I mean, again, if you have an excessive scappling, you have frequency splitting. And that's one of the graphs that I showed that uh, they knew about it uh, more than 70 years ago. Um, so, and that's part of uh, the design. I mean, so obviously uh, that's the problem, as I mentioned, to try to operate exactly a resonance and have a, a high coupling because potentially then you have uh, frequency splitting and uh, that complicates significantly the whole, <laughs> the whole system design. But we don't. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, um, let's see, next question comes from Regu and uh, is a, a practical question here. Hope, hopefully it's not too broad. Um, it says, what's the best and affordable tool out there to design an end-to-end -end 6.78 megahertz system? <laughs> I don't know. I think that, I believe right now the Air Fuel Alliance has a lot of uh, um, papers and, and potentially links to interesting uh, information about that. So that's the one that I'm... Uh, aware of. So there might be actually tools that are promoted by the Air Fuel Alliance. Um, 
I don't know if uh, besides that there are any specific uh, publications and I, I apologize if I'm not mentioning really important ones because uh, as I said, I'm, I'm not really aware. Um, so uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's my, my answer. So I'm, uh, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of information about that. Um, this stuff that was right. done in Qualcomm is obviously confidential the way it was done. Well, fair enough. And so actually what we'll close on that note, oh, a, a actually, question I had about standards. Oh, yeah, we, just a quick one. I see another one that appeared actually on the Q&A in the chat that says is if there are three devices being charged, is the charging time one third of the time? And uh, the response is not. Uh, uh, as long as the transmitter can deliver all the power, it will charge at the maximum power each device. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah, thank you for catching that. Um, so yeah, in terms of standards, you know, I think especially with things like Qi and, you know, and then eventually the air fuel lines and all that got put out there and ubiquitously adapted, um, it seems like there was a lot of kind of shortcomings, uh, especially in terms of, you know, the ability to maximize um, transmit efficiency and all that. So I'm just curious, can you comment or opine on some, maybe some key recommendations that you might have for you know, um, some, you know, quick improvements or areas of focus for, for standards like air fuel lines or Chi or whatever mm -hmm. out there? Um, I think that uh, the technical efforts that are going on in the Chi ecosystems are excellent. There's a lot of companies that are doing uh, a lot of work. And if you notice, you know, from along the years, you have gone from very low powers to fairly large power, you know, 15 watts is standardized already and they're working on higher wattage. So I believe that uh, a lot of companies there are making a lot of efforts in, in, in optimizing the efficiency there. So I don't think that, uh, you know, given the amount of effort, I don't think there's an easy way to say, hey, work on this, you're going to get better because there's a lot of work, people working on a lot of, uh, of the details. Um, if you look at the 6.78 megahertz, uh, what the, was the most uh, challenging area, if you want, and you may not even think about it, but everything else was easy. Uh, the antenna is small and is fairly efficient. Um, the rectifier, if you do synchronous rectification, um, is, is pretty good efficiency. And, uh, and now with gallium nitride, actually, you can do high power and synchronous rectification or transmission very efficiently. So that's not a problem. Well, we found the biggest problem, actually, amazingly enough, was the EMI filter. Because at the time that we developed this, the magnetic materials were not really very good at 6.78 megahertz. Now, actually, since a lot of the industry also in power conversion and so on has moved to higher frequencies, uh, you can find much better magnetic materials. But at the time, actually, the biggest trouble was actually to get inductors for the filters that had low losses at 6.78 megahertz. Can you believe that? That was the biggest inefficiency in the system. <laughs> Oh, well, I know. Yeah. A lot of those, uh, magnetics and, uh, those coil vendors have all stepped up a lot since yeah. then. So, um, all right. Well, with that, um, we'll, we'll, uh, wrap this up, but, uh, thank you very much again, Francesco for, um, you. your, your excellent presentation as well as your, um, generous, uh, donation, not only your time, but, um, that your sharing of the recording of this and the PDF, uh, as a reminder to everyone, we will make this available. It will the info uh, not only is it on our website, which is put in the chat, um, but we'll also uh, email that info out to uh, all registered attendees uh, within roughly a week's time. And uh, I'd also just give one last shout out again to our sponsors too, the uh, IEEE Pell Society, um, as well as our co-sponsors, the Santa Clara Valley Comsoc uh, Communication Society and the um, Santa Clara Valley. Uh, CT Society, Consumer Technology Society. So with that, uh, thank you very much again. Um, hope you're staying, staying safe and healthy out there. And um, keep an eye out or an ear out. You'll hear from us for uh, more events in the near future. And other than that, have a great day, a great afternoon, and a great evening. Uh, thanks again. Talk to you thank later. you bye all. Bye. Have a good day.